Um, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, Stanford is an institution that's played a big role in, in my family. My daughter got her PhD here. And um, it's great to be back. Um, I was at the first um, uh, meeting of your, your new organization in women's health and sex differences um, a few years ago. So, um, and I really appreciate the last talk where, you know, if you stay awake from my talk, you're not gonna get Alzheimer's disease, right? It's like an admonition, like if you keep your mind active here. Right? Um, all right, so I wanted to talk about um, some changes in my own thinking about uh, uh, sexual differentiation and sex determination. I wanna give a plug first to what Marcia just uh, said. We have a a national organization, actually an international organization called the Organization for the Study of Sex Differences. And the basic idea here is to bring basic scientists and, and physician scientists together uh, to talk about sex differences and disease and, um, and, and to promote uh, research to understand how um, disease influences males and females differently, partly with a, an eye towards um, uh, not only under, uh, you know, um, reversing the um, the historical lack of study of females and women, um, but also understanding what are the, the protective factors. Um, if, if one sex gets a disease more than the other sex, then there's something protecting one sex. And if we understood that, we might be able to target it, which is actually one of the themes of my talk. But, and we have a, a, a new journal called Biology of Sex Differences, and we um, uh, are eager to uh, have uh, new submissions in air, anything having to do with biology of sex differences. Okay, so uh, as a number of speakers today have talked about, we have um, sex differences in incidence or progression or uh, prognosis for a variety of disease. This is just one list and the numbers are uh, maybe a little off. They change uh, from study to study, but basically you have some diseases that uh, affect men more than women, some that affect um, females more than males. And so if our, one of our goals is to identify factors that protect one sex from disease and target therapies to enhance that factor or its downstream targets uh, to protect both sexes from disease. And, it, and these might actually be particularly interesting factors to target because sex-specific factors um, aren't usually terribly harmful. That is what pushes uh, the physiology or the pathology in a slightly different direction in male, males and females is probably not some factor that's gonna, gonna kill you. So, um, but our research over the last, over quite a few years has, um, has partly been to categorize. So if you're gonna answer that question, like if you have a disease and, and females, uh, so Alzheimer's disease, it influences females more than males, what could be the things that uh, protect the males, okay? What, what are the list of things, uh, uh, forces, that make males different than females? Um, and um, and uh, the, the basic answer to that question coming out of the 20th century was uh, hormones, okay? So if you're, so, so here's the, the basic dogma. Um, in mammals, it all starts um, at the time of fertilization uh, with XX versus XY. Um, there is a genetic decision made in the gonad that determines whether the gonads differentiate as testes or ovaries. And that uh, has been called, and, and has actually has been called sex determination since the 1930s. So one of the great pioneers here is um, Frank Lilly. And Lilly said, you have, you have to make a radical distinction between sex determination and sexual differentiation. They're, they're separate, discriminable processes. Why? This happens first, and it's genetic. And we now know, of course, that one of the genes in males is SRY. It's turned on in the gonad and directs the differentiation of the, of the undifferentiated uh, gonad to become a testis. And other genes in females cause it to differentiate into ovaries. And that is such an important decision that, that the male pathway inhibits the female pathway. The female pathway inhibits the male pathway because it would be disastrous um, for, for reproduction if you, if in, at least in humans or in mammals, um, if, if uh, you had an intersex condition here, okay? All right, and, but once the gonads form, then they, the, the, the Alfred Jost, the great endocrinologist, French endocrinologist of, of the mid-20th century, established 
that the gonads send a couple of different uh, hormones, and especially the testes that differentiate the rest of the body. So you have a coordinate differentiation, sexual differentiation of the body to match the gonads, and that's secondary and it's hormonal, okay? And so this basic decision is, I'm sh is still taught, uh, I'm sure, in basic biology in medical school. Um, the th this thinking permeates um, um, uh, uh, the whole field and um, uh, it it's still there. I can quote you uh, a, a paper published within the last few months that says exactly what I just said, as if it were still true, okay? Now the trouble with this is that there are some inconvenient truths that th there are sex differences that are not explained by this. That is phenotypic differences in non-gonadal traits that are not downstream of the, of the, of the effects of, of, of uh, hormones. And one that's been around for several decades, frankly, is X inactivation. So is this a phenotypic sex difference? Yeah. So this is something that every cell in the female, except in the germline, every cell in the, in the, every somatic cell in a female turns off one X chromosome. And this happens before the gonads differentiate. Okay, so th there's already a sex difference. Like one whole chromosome is shut down in every female cell, and it's not in any male cell. And, and did any of us think that this somehow was con conflicted with the theory of sexual differentiation? I mean, to me, sexual differentiation means the development of sex difference, and here's a sex difference, and it's not part of this whole um, uh, system. Now, does this make uh, you know, make a vagina d differentiate instead of uh, a scrotum? No. Does it make um, uh, a clitoris differentiate instead of, um, instead of a penis? No. That happens here. And of course, those are so fundamental to our thinking of what is male and female that that, in a sense, the, those are, have been thought of as kind of the defining sex difference. Basically, when the child, in, in the old days, when the child was born, you'd look between his legs to figure out whether it was male or female. Um, and uh, this does not determine that, but I think it's likely that this has fundamental ramifications for, for a number of sex differences that we don't really understand yet. Um, it's hard for me to point to one, okay, but, but I think we just don't understand it yet. So, so there are some sex differences that are not in, in, you know, part of the sex determination process. They've been essentially defined out just by our way of thinking about it. And so um, we're trying to not think about it that way. Now it's still true that wh where does it all start? It all starts at the time of fertilization. The basic sex difference is genetic. It's either XX or XY. So everything's downstream from that. And th there are three major categories of sex differences that we think about and try to discriminate in our lab. And um, the first two are hormonal because they are in fact the most important. Um, one are that gonadal hormones have effects uh, in adulthood, um, or actually all through life, because of their current um, action. So sitting here in the room right now, we have people with ovaries and we have some other people with testes, and they are secreting different hormones, and those hormones are having different effects, making those individuals different as we sit here right now. And those, it, those effects would go away if the gonadal hormones went away, and that's what's called an activational effect. On the other hand, there are some sex differences that would not go away if we took away everybody's hormones right now, okay? For example, all the guys with penises would still have a penis if they lost their testes, right? And the girls with vaginas would still have vaginas if, if they lost their, uh, their ovarian hormones. So there are some long-standing sex differences in body and in brain that have been known for, for really 50 years that are set up by um, prenatal and uh, perinatal secretion of hormones. But then we now recognize also that there are some sex chromosome effects. That is, they're direct effects of X and Y genes um, so this XX versus XY difference plays out in the gonads, makes the gonads differentiate, which sets up these big hormonal differences, but it also plays out in non-gonadal tissues like brain, liver, fat, muscle, wherever, um, a kidney, the, you know, each of my, uh, e each of our, you know, so my brain cell has a Y chromosome, I think my brain cells ha have a Y chromosome in it, 
in them all, and for some of you that's not true, and the question is, does that make any difference in our brain cells? We don't really know much about that. We actually think now that the number of X chromosomes is coming out to, to make a much bigger difference than whether the Y chromosome is different. So I wanted to um, give some data that sets up the, these uh, different ways of thinking, and, and, and one of the main mouse models that we use is we call the four core genotypes, which was pioneered by Paul Burgoyne and Robin Lovell Badge at the National Institute for Medi uh, Medical Research in London. And they gave us uh, these mice, and we've been using them. In these mice, um, gonadal sex and sex chromosome complement are no longer um, uh, dependent on each other. So here's the SRY gene, this testis determining gene, sitting on the Y chromosome. And in these mice, the SRY gene is deleted from the Y chromosome and inserted as a transgene onto uh, an autosome. And so now the, the testis determining uh, uh, chromosome becomes this autosome. And whether the animal is XX or y, XY no longer determines whether it has testes or ovaries. So this makes four kinds of what we sometimes call four sexes. They're, the animals are either XX or XY, XX or XY, and they either have um, ovaries or they have testes. And it's a basically a two by two, it's a two-way ANOVA, it's a two by two uh, interaction here. And we ask the mouse, um, um, okay, let's measure a trait that is different between males and females and see which of these factors, sex chromosome complement or gonadal type, influences the trait. And so if we, if we find this, so here the trait is color-coded, and if we find, uh, we, we usually take out the gonads uh, of the adult mice to get rid of one of the three big classes, which is the activational effects of hormones. So we take out the gonads and we compare animals with, uh, under the same hormonal condition in adulthood, either no hormone at all or give them both all the same hormone levels. And if the trait is the same in these two groups and different from these two groups, then we say that the trait is caused by hormones, most likely, okay? Because it correlates with the type of gonad. But if we get this result where the trait is different in XX animals, independent of their gonadal type, than in XY, then we say it's a sex chromosome complement. And just to illustrate the kind of interaction that Daphna was talking about, if you stare at the screen, for five seconds, just pick a point on the screen and stare at it, and then look at this and you say, how many colors do you see? I'll do it again. So five seconds, five, four, three, two, one. How many colors do you see? Uh, so this is a visual, it's a, uh, uh, there's a guy in my department who's a visual physiologist. He says this is happening in your cerebral cortex. And um, it's a visual analog of, a two, of an interaction factor in a two-way ANOVA, okay? So it shows an interaction of the two effects where you get four colors instead of two uh, because both of the two color schemes are interacting with each other. It goes in both ways, but it works better if you go backwards. I mean, I can't. Yeah, if it works, I don't know for colorblind people. I don't know, so, okay. So basically, we've been studying these mice for a while and studying a, a variety of different um, phenotypes, uh, and for a long time we weren't finding very many sex chromosome effects, or when we found them they weren't very big, but we've recently found one that's bigger, and it has to do with um, adipos adiposity and metabolism, and here the sex chromosomes really do make a difference in a variety of complex ways and we really don't understand. Um, Suki Chen in my lab discovered this and has done many of the studies that I'll, uh, I, I'll, I'll describe. But we immediately knew that we couldn't study this alone because we basically knew almost nothing about adiposity and metabolism. Um, and so uh, Karen Rui came in as really the intellectual leader of our team. She's an expert uh, geneticist, an expert on um, fat and uh, metabolic disease. So she's, she's the leader here. So if you just weigh a mouse, so if you just weigh a mouse um, at weaning when they're three weeks old, the males and females don't much weigh much different. So you can see we have these four sexes. They're either XX or XY. They're gonadal females or gonadal males. By the time of they've passed through puberty or partially through puberty, the two gonadal male groups are weighing more than the two gonadal female groups. 
suggesting that the hormones are increasing the body weight of, so either the testicular horm hormones are e increasing the body weight of males, or the ovarian hormones are suppressing the body of weight of the females. And it goes along with uh, uh, um, gonadal sex. However, there's also riding on top of this a smaller sex chromosome effect. And I'm going to go to a, um, a different curve here. So if we study, again, body weight over a period of weeks, and we're talking over many weeks here, at week zero here, the animal's two and a half months old. So the animal's adult now. It's well past puberty. And we've measured the body weight of the four groups. You can see that the two gonadal female groups weigh less than the two gonadal male groups. And that's about a 25% difference. So the hormone effect is big. Riding on top of it, there's an XX versus XY effect. So in both the gonadal males and the gonadal females, the XX animals weigh more than the XYs. And that's a sex chromosome effect. OK, now if you take out the gonads, this is, so those first points are with all sex biasing factors operating. The, the gonads are there. The, the, the animals have passed through, uh, they've been influenced by hormones all their lives, but then we take out the gonads on, on that day and we follow the body weight for a number of months. After about a month, the, this hormone effect goes away. So that's, we think, due to circulating levels of gonadal hormones that um, you take away the hormones and the sex difference caused by hormones goes away. All right? But if you, and if you stop there, you just say, okay, that's a act, classic activational effect of hormones. It's there when the hormones are there, you take them away, the sex difference goes away. But if you wait longer, then you get a more complicated pattern. First of all, the two XX groups get to be, on average, about 25% heavier than the two XY groups. So that's a group difference that's as big as the hormone effect. Now, you do have to wait a while for that, it to get that big, like 10 months or so but it's, it's a big effect in the absence of adult hormones. Um, and so there is a sex chromosome effect. In addition to that, there's also an, a, a, a gonadal effect that makes XX gonadal females different from XX gonadal males, but that only happens in the XX group. So it's, this is, we think is a long last, the animals at this point has not had its gonads for you know, 10 months or so. I don't, uh, at least a lot of months. Um, for a long time, it hasn't had any gonadal hormones, and yet what kind of gonad it used to have back here is having an effect in the XX animals, but not the XY. So you have this complex interaction of several, of all three major classes of, of, uh, of uh, factors. First of all, the activational effects, the circulating effects of hormones dominate. Um, the other factors are there, but you can only see them when you take away those um, the, those activational effects, and uh, they're big. Now, one of the reviewers of the paper, when we submitted this, said, well, this isn't very interesting because you're studying animals without gonads, and most people have gonads. Um, well, that's true, but there are, um, um, uh, 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 so the sex chromosome effect may be, if it's relevant to humans at all, which of course we don't know yet, if it's relevant to humans at all, it might be relevant to hypogonadal conditions, for example, in aging uh, people. So um, I was talking to a lay group of postmenopausal women at a women's health center at UCLA, and, and they all understood that having two X chromosomes might, make, might influence adiposity um, relative to, to having one X chromosome. That is, it, it, after menopause, um, some women experience an increase in body weight, um, and that is attributed to the loss of hormones. That's true, but it might be larger because they have two X chromosomes than if they had had one X chromosome. So, um, all right. So, um, so I've just stated all of these things, I think. Um, but one of the important things here is that sex biasing factors can reduce the impact of each other, okay? Um, some gonadal and some gonadal effects last a, a long time. But if you look at body weight, for example, there, males are, gonadal males are heavier than gonadal females, but having a female genome makes the animals heavier than having a, a male genome. So here you have um, opposition of two sex specific factors that are counteracting each other. Um, you can say that, that the uh, effects of hormones blunt the effects of sex chromosomes, but you can also say, as Daphna pointed out, 
that the effects of sex chromosomes blunt the effect of sex hormones. And so, so you have this compensatory effect. And, and one of the things that I'm becoming more and more impressed here is that in, in the whole animal or the whole human, we have a number of, of definable, separate sex biasing factors, all of which that are making the males and females different, but they're actually also a lot of times making males and females more similar than they otherwise would be, okay? And a big uh, example of this is X inactivation, which I mentioned early on, because when one of the two X chromosomes is shut down in the female cell, that means that it has one active X chromosome just like a male cell, and X activation is actually a compensatory um, uh, evolutionary phenomenon where it makes the female more like the male. It makes the, the dosage ratio between X genes and autosomal genes more similar in the two sexes so that they evolve a more optimum, uh, a better optimum that works in both sexes. So sexual differentiation, paradoxically, um, often has to do with making the sexes more similar or, the, or might more often have to do with this than, than we might think because we have these different sex biasing factors. So per, some, per, some and perhaps many sex differences evolved to make the sexes more equal. More equal than what? More equal than they would have been otherwise, okay? And one, when one sex biasing factor is eliminated, so, if, so in our case, we took out one sex biasing factor, which were the adult hormone levels, leaving others to have their effects and to have their effects be ma magnified. So the activational effects of hormones that were making males and females different. Once we took those away, then you could see this development of a very large sex chromosome effect, which wasn't as large previously. And so it's because these factors are in opposition to each other that if you knock a gene out or you take a hormone away, you can see effects that you didn't previously see. All right, so uh, how am I doing on time, Darn Russia? Okay, so just to mention that this is not just about body weight. The, the biggest effect in some ways is the effect on fat mass. Um, that if we look at these four groups 10 months after gonadectomy, um, uh, looking at, let's say, absolute fat mass is a, almost twice as uh, much, it's twice as high in XX than XY. Again, there's an interaction and, and there's a sex effect in the XX animals but not XY. Uh, lean mass is, is, is greater than in XXXY and the fat mass is percent body weight is about 50% higher. And this is a pretty big effect, especially because these animals, the people who study metabolism generally put the animal on a high fat diet to kind of stress the system. And these animals are just eating a low fat chow, it's like 5% fat. The fact that you could get so, such obesity in a kind of, uh, uh, in kind of a regular animal um, uh, is uh, remarkable in, in the field. All right, now, if it's an XX versus XY difference, we want to find the genes. And the first question, is it on the X chromosome or is it on the Y chromosome? So we have other mouse models to follow up on this. This is a mouse model that has some genotype names that are very arcane and complicated and confusing. But basically, the, there's four groups. So it's, they're, they're similar to XX, XXY, XY, and XO plus an extra pseudo-autosomal region. So you can think of these as XO. Uh, so these, the bottom two groups have one X chromosome, the top two groups have two X chromosomes, and the two groups in the middle have a Y chromosome. And the question is, is it having a Y or not that's making the animals uh, difference in, in, in body weight and fat, or is it the number of X chromosomes? And the answer is it's, it's the number of X chromosomes. So the two top groups with two X chromosomes, uh, it's the same experiment where you take the animals at 75 days, you take out their gonads, uh, the, the gonadal male, the, two of these animals are gonadal males because they have a Y chromosome, um, but um, it's the animals that have two X chromosomes that get to be fatter. So we know it's an X gene. Um, which X genes are top candidates are those that escape X inactivation. So even though one X chromosome is shut down in every female cell, uh, some genes escape this inactivation, and there aren't very many of them, and so we're we, we're kind of glad that there aren't very many of them because we don't have a huge long list of candidates. But these are our top candidates, and these are genes you've probably never heard before. Uh, this is a, um, a histone uh, demethylase, so it's an epigenetic re regulating gene. Um, these are genes that are expressed all over the body. They're not just in, you know, it's hard to pick them out, and there's about six of them that are on our list, and so we're uh, trying as best we can to manipulate these uh, genes uh, using genetic me methods to um, see 
uh, which of these might be involved in these body weight and, and met metabolic traits. Now, one of the main, why are the XX animals fatter? We've measured a number of things like their activity and, and their uh, body temperature. Something's going on with body temperature, but one of the most consistent things is that XX animals eat more than XY during the day, which is when they should be sleeping. So the kind of, if this is true in humans, the, the, the point is, and, and in fact, there is a human syndrome where people eat at night um, abnormally at night, and it does lead to obesity. So when you eat determines in part whether you lay down fat or not. And so we think this, might, this has something to do with it, that the animals, uh, the XX animals are eating more during the day. They're not eating more during the night, okay? It's only during the day. Um, and they show less flexibility in shifting fuel source from day to night. So, so this is the respiratory quotient, which is the amount of carbon dioxide produced relative to the amount of oxygen consumed. And it's, at, it's during this sleep phase, or during the, the lights on phase, where you see the XX animals have a higher respiratory quotient, which means that, um, that, that they're having um, less flexibility in, in shifting. This is the phase when they should be metabolizing what they ate during the dark, but they're eating instead. All right, uh, you also have a, a uh, an effect on uh, leptin levels, which is a major feedback hormone, the sex chromosome effect on leptin. Um, if you put these animals on a high-fat diet to stress them metabolically, then you exacerbate this difference. So this, the sex chromosome effect um, is, is apparent more, more rapidly. Um, and you put them on this kind of like, a, it's like a cookie diet. It's high-fat, high-sugar. They love it. It's very sweet. And the XX animals eat more of that. Um, at, uh, during the day than, than the XYs. If you put them on a high-fat diet, then all hell kind of breaks loose metabolically. If you look at the livers, um, this is a condition called, uh, it's a high triglyceride accumulation by the liver. It's called fatty liver. It's a uh, risk factor for liver cancer in humans. And these are the two XX groups up here with this kind of Swiss cheese looking liver, liver after 16 weeks, weeks on a high-fat diet, high-fat, um, high sugar, and these are the two X, X groups. All right, so this is a summary of some of the things I said. The number of X chromosomes has dramatic effects on, um, on adiposity and weight gain uh, because the animals eat more. Um, it's exacerbated by a high-fat diet. There's a dysregulation of metabolism and accumulation of triglycerides in the litter, uh, liver. Okay, so um, if I have just a couple minutes left, then I'll talk about, so we have been kind of teasing apart these big three, big three classes of sex biasing factors, and we can do a transcriptome analysis, that is a microarray analysis of gene expression in different tissues to see by pitting these three factors against each other, by varying the level of hormones in adulthood, by varying what type of gonad they had and, and their organizational uh, effects and, and the sex chromosome effects all in one experiment, we can see which of these dominate in the control of gene expression. And I'll, I showed you this kind of thing where we're, it's a two by two study. And, and so now we do a, a, a three-way study where we take all four genotypes and at 75 days of age, we take out their gonads and we then treat them with either testosterone, estradiol, or blank. And then three weeks later, we kill them for a microarray. And so our kind of diagram here is not just, so we have, in, instead of just four boxes, we have 12 boxes where uh, this, uh, this is, the difference between the, this, this group of boxes and this group is, is what kind of sex chromosome. The difference here is what kind of gonads they have, the long-term effects of gonadal hormones. And here, you have a blank testosterone or estradiol, it's level of hormones. So we're looking for, uh, three kind, we're looking for genes that have patterns that are different across hormone levels, and that would show that they're responding to different levels of hormones. We're looking for genes that are different between animals that grew up with testes or ovaries but no longer have those, uh, the gonads. And we're looking for genes that are XX versus XY. And if you look at four different tissues here, so liver, fat, periaqueductal gray, a brain region, uh, involved in a lot of things, including <coughs> pain, which we were interested in, and the striatum. <clears throat> you can see that in each of these tissues, there's a larger number of genes that respond to the adult level of hormones. These are what we call the activational effects, the short-term effects of hormones. 
that is, whether the animal is, is, has testosterone or estradiol now makes a difference in a larger set of genes um, than the other sex biasing factors. The second class is what kind of gonad did they grow up with, um, long-lasting effects of gonadal hormones, and the third class are uh, sex chromosome effects, uh, differences between XX and XY. So we're interested in these different gene sets and trying to figure out in different tissues which ones are important. Um, I'm kind of skipping a couple slides here, but <clears throat> our, our goal here is to identify, we're focused on sex chromosomes because not very many people are. Um, we're interested in identifying novel X and Y sex determining genes, and we call them sex determining genes even though they don't determine whether the animal has a penis or clitoris because they influence the sexual bias in tissues. Um, how they, it does influence the, um, the sexual bias, okay? How do primary sex determining genes change the physiology and, and disease? And, and we're in, interested in studying how hormones and sex chromosome genes uh, interact. So we have this kind of diagram um, uh, uh, that I gave you a simpler, uh, we have you know, hormone effects that are the dominant effects causing sex differences. We have sex chromosome effects which are less um, dominant, but still, at least they're on the list at this point. So these are the people um, that did the work. Um, Suki Chen is a major figure in our lab. Yuchiro Ito is another pillar of my lab. Uh, he's a, um, my graduate student, Shana Williams, is doing a great project on Klinefelter's disease. Um, and we're embedded in a laboratory of neuroendocrinology at UCLA that's had a long history of studying sex differences in a variety of ways. Um, and um, we have a training program for this uh, group. And um, we're, uh, we have some really important collaborators, such as Karen Rui, um, Mansur Egbali, Jay Pelusis, Eric Villain, Rhonda Voskul, and uh, the mice all came from London. So thanks very much. Um,